I would like to share with you a situation that Jack Canfield described in his book called The Success Principle. He tells a story about a, a college kid and his girlfriend who decides to come home for the summer. Uh, they uh, decided that they would like to get a part-time job so that they can have some spending money. On day one, the girl gets up and she begins to put together a very polished resume. She does what most people are instructed to do. However, the boy gets up and he picks up the phone and he begins to call all of the local places to see who might need someone. Now let's go on to day two. While the girl is still polishing and finishing her resume, and by this time, I must say, she has a very, very flawed product. The boy, on the other hand, has secured a job. Now I want you to keep this scenario in mind as I begin to discuss the um, next step in our process, which is the execution. Continue with the theme from the last two episodes. Once you've set a definite chief aim, once you've outlined a broad plan of how you're going to reach that highest goal, your next step is to execute those steps. That is, to take actions to realize or to bring about your single, all-encompassing goal. So in this episode, what I would like to do is I would like to kind of explore this execution step. I would like to speak about what taking action mean and why it is important. Two, some of the principal reasons why we fail to take action. Three, timing as it relates to take an action, and I will wrap up with some final conclusions. Now, many personal development experts, strategists from all disciplines, as well as empowerment coaches, emphasizes the point that nothing significant happens until we begin to take action until we begin to execute upon that plan that we devise with the objective of reaching our definite chief aim. Now, taking action is nothing more than acting upon that game plan that you have devised as a result of your planning sessions. Taking action means that you're stopping mental deliberation, that you're halting all debate, that you're getting up from the planning table and simply taking the next steps in your goal to reach your definite chief aim. Now, when this happens, when you begin to take actions, there are certain benefits that you will experience. One, you will begin to learn from your experiences in a way that you cannot learn by simply listening to someone else speak or by reading the book. You will begin to receive immediate feedback on what you are doing, how you are doing it. Just so you can either take actions to make adjustments or you continue to do what you're doing, but do it better, do it more efficiently and do it quicker. You'll begin to move closer and closer to the realization of your goal. You will be able to demonstrate to the world the seriousness of your intention. More importantly, you become a magnet for those other like-minded individuals who will align themselves with you because they share a similar vision. Now, with so many life-impacting benefits that taking action can have, why are there so many individuals who desire to have th their harsh desires? Why are there so many individuals that desire to reach their highest level of achievement? 
Why are there so many individuals that desire to be better, to have better, to do more? Why are they paralyzed to act? As someone who has managed and coached hundreds of individuals throughout my career, I've identified five key reasons that typically prevent us from acting. Acting upon that game plan that we've devised. Taking the steps necessary to realize the thing that we say we desire the most. The first one is the fear of failure. The thing that we say that we desire the most, yet our fear of getting it wrong, of doing it wrong, overrides our ability to achieve what we want because we fear getting it wrong. The belief that now is not the right time. The thought or the feeling that I might not have enough information or that I'm lacking the right information. The tendency to overthink, to overanalyze, or to overplan. Or my favorite, the need to wait for someone else to tell us that it is okay to act. These are the five key reasons why those who desire to have their heart's desire, those who desire to be better, to have better, to do all that they can do, these reasons prevent them from acting. Now, while it is true that taking premature action can be just as catastrophic as taking no action at all, we cannot delay executing upon that game plan that we've devised in efforts to reach our definite chief aim. We can't do that out of hope for the perfect plan, out of hope for the perfect time, and out of hope for the perfect situation. Instead, we should begin to take action now whenever we have identified a broad series of steps that we should be taking in order to reach our definite chief aim. We should take action now, even though we don't have the proper plan or the right plan. We should begin to act now, even though we don't think that now might be the absolute perfect timing. We should begin to act now, even if we believe that the actions that we're taking may not be the absolute perfect actions to take. We should begin to act now even though others are telling us to wait. We should begin to act now. Now as we begin to take these steps necessary for reaching our definite chief aim, for executing the game plan that we've devised in pursuit of our highest desires, there will be some missteps. There will be some false starts. There will be some mistakes. There will be times when we think that if we do a certain action, it's going to bring about a certain result. And it doesn't. But when, not if, but when this time happens, we must not get discouraged. We must not give up. We must not get disappointed. We must take it in stride. We must make a mental note of the action of it and of its outcome. And we must simply move on and execute the next steps in our game plan. Now, if we return to my scenario that I outlined in my introduction, there are those who would argue the point that while the boy got a job pretty quick, it was a girl who was best prepared for the right fit job. Additionally, there were those who would argue that while the boy got a pretty good job, that because it was so quick, he might come to find out that he doesn't like it and therefore need to start over because it's not the right fit for him. And while both of these points are very valid, I don't know if that was the case in this example 
because Jack did not elaborate on that point. Now, I am not here to argue the point that planning, right, that planning, that we should do no planning. I mean, that would be foolish of me. And trust me, I am no fool. What I am arguing for or, or positioning is that once we've done our due diligence on that planning side, we cannot become so paralyzed to act upon that plan out of hope for the perfect plan, out of waiting for the perfect timing, out of waiting for the perfect storm. Because if we've learned anything from the emergent strategy school of thought, we know that once we have identified a broad series of steps that we should be taking to reach our goal, we should begin to act upon those steps today and then elect the full plan expand and develop along the journey. Because he who devises his plans, he who takes the necessary steps in order to reach that plan, he who learns from mistakes and missteps, and he who makes the necessary adjustments will achieve far greater than the person who sits back and wait for the perfect plan, who sits back and wait for the perfect timing, who sits back and wait for someone else to tell them that's okay to act, who sits back and wait and analyze every possible thing that could go wrong. He who acts will achieve far more than he who does not act. And as an aspiring winner, which person are you?